we have a number of sections that we're reading from the scriptures, uh, beginning with Jeremiah uh, 17. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, verses 1 uh, to 13. You'll find the reading on uh, page 781, if you're using the Bible um, that you may have picked up on your way into church. So, um, Jeremiah 17, uh, Jeremiah speaking uh, principally to the church in the south, uh, Judah, and he's speaking of a judgment that is going to come upon them as it uh, has come upon Israel, uh, the northern church, and of course it is because of sin. But mixed in with this uh, announcement of judgment is what we've been seeing again and again, an announcement of grace. And um, in uh, this passage, uh, verse 13, which we'll come to, you'll notice that um, Jeremiah speaks of the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel. And he's not speaking about an idea or a philosophy. He's speaking about an individual. So let's read together. Um, Jeremiah 17 verse 1 The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron With a point of diamond it is engraved on the tablet of their heart And in the horns of their altars While their children remember their altars and their asherim Beside every green tree and on the high hills on the mountains in the open country. Your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave to you and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know for in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. His trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according <coughs> to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds, like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days, they will leave him, and at his end he will be a fool. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of of living water. And then we turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew uh, chapter 12 uh, and we're reading from verse uh, 15 uh, through to verse uh, 21. And uh, Jesus has been challenged here by the religious leaders because of his work on the Lord's day, and so he withdraws from them, we're told in verse 
15, and then we read, And many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my chosen whom I, sorry, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone bear his voice, hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not quench, until he brings victory, sorry, brings justice to victory, and his name the Gentiles or the nations will hope. So the hope of Israel and the hope of the nations. And then we go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And you'll find the reading, we're beginning at verse 30. You'll find the reading on uh, page 1078. So Jesus has been speaking of being the light of the world. And uh, we read then, verse 30, page 1078. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are the offspring of Abraham, and have never been a slave to anyone. How is it that you say, You will become free? Amen. I would ask you please to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. And Matthew uh, chapter 1. Um, I want to uh, just take a break this morning from Joshua as we come to the end of the year. Uh, we've been in a holiday time uh, and uh, it's a time when we reflect hopefully upon the past year. It's a time when we give thanks for our Saviour uh, and um, it's a time for us to sharpen our focus again. Uh, so we want to look this morning uh, at this section in Matthew chapter 1 and we're looking at the section from verse 1 uh, through uh, to verse uh, 17 <clears throat> and of course immediately you'll be thankful that you're not um, reading these verses because they are largely uh, from verse 1 through to verse 16 they are a family tree or a genealogy um, to use the bigger word um, and um, I wonder how many of you have researched your family tree. Um, if you're going to do it, when we're going to do it, we've got to be prepared for all kinds of things. Uh, nice surprises and maybe uh, not so nice uh, surprises. Um, but it is something that is a, a quite a, an interest in wider society uh, today to, to know where we've come from and um, who we're related to. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, a long lost relative from Canada, I didn't know existed, uh, sent me a copy of a family tree on my mother's side and it runs into hundreds of pages. And being the diligent person that you know I am, you'll know I've read every single page of that. Um, no, I haven't. All I've done is I've gone to the little section that deals with my mother's family and that's a couple of pages in a couple of hundred page document. Um, family trees tend not to be the most gripping of material to read. Uh, and um, they're not the kind of reading that causes you to turn page after page and not to be able to leave the thing down. Fairly dry stuff. This one was born to this family and married this one, had these children. Tells us very little, doesn't it? Uh, just about, it only tells us about relationships. And so this morning we're coming to Matthew chapter 1. 
and it is a family tree but it is a very special family tree uh, boys and girls it is the family tree of Jesus of Jesus uh, the one who was um, uh, and is the Son of God who then was born as a man um, or born as a human being into the family of Mary and uh, uh, born for the purpose of saving us from our sins. It's a really, really important family tree. And if you were a Jew, that's the people that we read of in the Old Testament, your family tree was big, big business. And uh, uh, as we saw from our reading this morning in John chapter 8, it was something that Jesus talked about. Um, as we uh, read of Paul, remember Paul prided himself uh, and what he was in his family tree. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am a true-blooded Jew. So it is in that context that Matthew then begins his gospel with what to us might seem very dry and dusty, a family tree. Because if he wants in this gospel to get attention of the Jews, and he wants them to understand why the Christ came, and who that he has come, and who he is, and what he's done, he has to start at the beginning and show them that uh, Jesus Christ is born of the Jews and indeed that he fulfills uh, what is promised in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be born from the family of Abraham and the family of David so that's the purpose here and from your point of view and my point of view uh, that is less of an issue with our Gentile background. Nonetheless, we shouldn't pass over this saying, well, I'm not a Jew and I don't necessarily need to be persuaded right the way back to Abraham. But there are really key things that we can learn about God from genealogies. So when you come to genealogies in your Bible reading, don't skip over them. Tempting as that is to do. But ask yourself, what is the purpose in this genealogy here? What can I learn uh, from it? What is God wanting to teach me? And there are three things that I think we can learn from this. There are probably others, but we want to focus on three this morning. First of all, we want to focus on God's constant faithfulness. Or God's continuing faithfulness or we could even say God's covenant faithfulness Matthew sets out his genealogy um, it's not the full family tree of Jesus remember he is trying to show the legal steps the steps that prove legally that Jesus is the son of David the son of Abraham so he doesn't include every last individual he key, includes key people like David uh, and like Solomon and then showing right down at the end of the captivity. And he does this um, in three groups of 14 generations. So why that? Well, um, there may be deeper reasons, but the most immediate reason was this. And if you were a Jew, you didn't have your own Bible at home, boys and girls, that you could open at any time. The only place you heard the Bible was when you went to church. And so you tried to learn off, like learning a poem, and memorize scripture. And these names were put together. Matthew chose 14 key names from Abraham to David. 14 key names uh, from David through to the captivity and 14 three key names beyond the captivity so that they would be able to remember the key personnel, the key figures. It's a bit like um, if you remember when you were doing exams at school 
uh, you tried when it came to a topic, if it was history you're doing or science or whatever, you tried to get a heading and to hang three or four big points in that that then would lead you out into the smaller points. And that's the way we learn things. And that's what's happening here. But here's the point. This period from Abraham through to the time of the birth of Jesus, how long does it cover? 100 years? 200 years? 500 years? 1,000 years? No, actually 2,000 years. 2,000 years. And if we were to add to that, and we don't know how, we don't have a date for when uh, Adam and Eve were created, or when the fall happened, but bear in mind that the promise of the Christ has gone back before Abraham to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Here we are reminded of God's continuing faithfulness to his promise, to his purpose of salvation. Not just for the Jews, as we'll see later, but also for the Gentiles. Do you remember God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12? All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Your own people will be blessed, but much, much wider. So here we have a remarkable period of time. If someone waits for 5, 10 years, maybe 15 years after they're married, do they have a baby? We admire that couple, don't we? For their steadfastness, for their contentment, for their trust in the Lord, their submission to the Lord. And for us, that's a long time. Or maybe there's something else that we've waited for and maybe it's been 30 40 years but here 2000 years reminds us of what peter says doesn't it a thousand years are as a day in your sight god is not bound by time the only thing that binds god is his purpose and his promise and he will be faithful to that and his timing will also be faithful in that. Because Paul reminds us that it was at the right time that Jesus was born of the Jews. So in every generation of Israel's history, um, in every epoch of her history, in every uh, up and down, every twist and turn, and um, we see the faithfulness of God. Think of how the promise was put in jeopardy by Abraham potentially when he gave, when he took Hagar and didn't believe. And yet God ensured that his purpose was uh, continued. Think of um, later on uh, how his purpose was put in jeopardy, in inverted commas, when the Jews uh, turned to the false gods around about them and worshipped them. And God had to take them into captivity. And for a period of 70 years, um, it seemed as if the promise uh, was, uh, was not going to, to happen. But God brings them back, brings back a remnant. Because he is faithful to his purpose and to his promise. And his purpose, as Matthew states it here, has been to bring forth uh, the woman, um, or the seed of the woman, the child born of Mary. Uh, Jesus, who is called Christ, verse 16. And so, there have been all these different eras, there have been different experiences, there have been good days, there have been bad days, uh, there have been twists and turns, there has been the experience of discipline uh, in captivity, there's been the experience of abundance under Solomon, there's been this experience of the difficult work 
of restoration and reconstruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. And there have been then more recently, before Matthew, and from Malachi to Matthew, the years of silence. 300 years when there was no new word from God. And people might have thought, God has forgotten us. God has changed his purpose. But no, even in those years of silence, he was being constant in his faithfulness. And his faithfulness was continuing. So that's the first thing that we see this morning. God's constant faithfulness. Over 2,000 years. Over all the different experiences, good and bad, uh, that happened to his church and to individuals within that church. And so we take heart from that. We take heart from that. This was speaking about the first coming of Christ. And while we look back uh, to the Christ who came and the Christ who uh, lived and died and rose again, we must always keep a forward look. And you see, that's what our society doesn't want to do. Our society is quite happy with the baby in the manger, but not with the king on the throne. The king who's going to come again. He's going to come, having come once unto salvation, he's going to come a second time unto judgment. But you see, for you and me, we need to hold that fast in our uh, vision of life and our perspective on society. And we need to remember that God's purpose is not set back by a single event that happens in this world. Neither by disease or illness, neither by war or famine, neither by the, um, the um, activities of rulers or ordinary people. Yes, he's at work through all of those. But he's not confined, he's not limited by any of those. And his purpose continues steadfast today. The purpose, the time that he set for the coming of Christ is exactly the same today as it was when he decided it in eternity past. And so we can have confidence in this God. Because... In Christ, when we know Christ as our Savior from our sin and as the Lord of our lives, we know that in our lives as a congregations and as individuals, that the Lord God will be absolutely faithful. Faithful. Was it Jeremiah who wrote those lamentations? Great is your faithfulness. And that was in a day of judgment. And we are living to one degree or another in days of God's judgment. And we need to remember as his people great is your faithfulness. He will be faithful to you boys and girls growing up in your homes and all those challenges that you face as you grow up uh, difficulties maybe in friendships, challenges in school and uh, in life and you could come to the point and say well I don't want ever to leave mommy and daddy and I don't want to leave home because I'm scared of that world but boys and girls you have a God who offers himself to you in Christ as your saviour and he says I am faithful I will protect you I will be with you I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And as we look back on the past year, whatever has been our experience of the year, whether it's been a year of ups uh, in every way, or whether it's been a year of downs in every way, or whether it's been a year that has been like a rocky road, let's 
be encouraged today, even though we can't understand the twists and the turns and the highs and the lows, let's remember God's continuing faithfulness. And let's be encouraged by that into the next year in the unknowns and in whatever circumstances unfold for each one of us. Let's remind ourselves if and when days are dark and difficult, God is faithful. His continuing faithfulness. His constant faithfulness. Let's notice then secondly, God's overflowing grace. Because that's the second thing that we see here. Um, I want to ask the question, why was God determined that Jesus, who is called Christ, should be born? Why did he never take his eye off that goal? What is so special and so needful about his birth? Well, John provides us with the answer, does he not, in his account uh, of the uh, Christ in, in John chapter 1, he says, The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, full of grace and truth. You see, it was essential that there was a man who walked the earth again, who was full of grace and truth. Because that had been lost in the days of Adam and Eve. Yes, for a time they had walked with God and God had walked with them and they were full of grace and truth. But we know, and we can't get away from Genesis chapter 3, that great change, that dramatic event of the fall that has changed, that changed everything immediately for everyone. For all time, so that all human beings, where a man and woman are involved in creating life, all human beings are born in sin. And our lives end up being shaped and marred by iniquity. The child doesn't have to be taught to throw its toys into the pram in a fit of rage because it's not getting what it wants. It knows instinctively. It knows naturally to do that. Children don't have to grow up seeing their parents arguing or fighting um, to, to learn to fight. And we know that, don't we, as parents? Uh, we've seen it in our children. And that's because of this sin that has entered in. And so grace was lost. Truth was lost. But now uh, God uh, purposes that uh, one is going to come. A man is going to be born. And it's not going to involve the union of a man and a woman. It's the union of the Holy Spirit with a woman. As Matthew tells us. Conceived of the Holy Spirit. So this one was without sin and is without sin, full of grace and full of truth. And he came to a people um, that, as Peter sums up in Acts 8 verse 23, poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Bitterness, iniquity. Isn't that two of the telltale signs of Human nature, human society, bitterness and sin. Paul said there is no one righteous, no, not one. And so God sent forth his son, Christ, uh, full of grace and truth to restore um, the availability of grace to Adam's fallen race. <coughs> And so the Christ came and he lived a life without sin, unlike us. And he died in the place of us, 
sinners. The place we deserve to be. He experienced the hell that we deserve. But you see here now we look at this, um, this genealogy. And what do we see here? We see a list of names that goes from Abraham right through uh, to Joseph. And everyone in this list began being conceived in sin and shaped by iniquity. But then their lives were changed by grace. Abraham, for example, Moses refers to him in Joshua and he talks about how Abraham worshipped the moon god while he was back in, in uh, Babylon. And it was God who called him sovereignly and revealed himself. And Abraham believed God and went out not knowing where he was going. And so a man changed from idolatry to the worship of the true God. Or you dip into the list further down and you see a David. And you remember that David, boys and girls... He grew up in a godly home, didn't he? And he was the one that was God's chosen to be king of Israel. But then David did an awful thing, didn't he? He did some awful things as king. He took a woman that wasn't his to be his wife. She was another man's wife. And then he killed her husband. And he lied and he deceived. And here he was. He was a Christian when he was doing this. A believer when he was doing this. And God then dealt with him again through his prophet Nathan. And he sent him boys and girls in the way in which maybe sometimes mum and dad's got to come to you. And they've got to say, look at what you've done. This is not right in God's sight. And you've got to acknowledge like David that you have sinned and what did David experience? Renewed grace. Renewed grace. Psalm 51, he talks about in Psalm 32, the restoration of grace. Because God is the God of overflowing grace. Not only taking us out of our unbelief and idolatry, but then even when we fall seriously as Christians, and we bring shame upon his name. And we bring shame upon ourselves. And we bring shame upon our families. We don't have to remain in that place of shame. There is the way back. The way of the cross. The way of renewed repentance. The way of renewed faith. And so, um, like David... We are restored to God because he is the God of overflowing grace. His grace, he doesn't give it one day and take it away the next. His grace is overflowing. Uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Now that's not an invitation for you and me to be careless about our sin. It's not a reason for us to say, well, it doesn't matter how I live. God's the God of grace. I can go and do whatever I want with someone that I'm not married to. I can say whatever I want and who's Lord over my tongue. Uh, I can cheat and steal. No, no, no. Anyone who lives like that shows by their fruit that there isn't the root of grace in them. Because where there is the root of grace, there will be the fruit of grace, albeit imperfectly. And there will be a sorrow for sin, even as David grieved over his sin. And of course then, there's one final person I want to mention in this. Look at verse 10. You've got Manasseh. Manasseh. None of us feel very comfortable with Manasseh, do we? A man that started well and, or ended up with so many uh, blemishes in his life. And yet here he is. 
listed in this genealogy because of what? Not anything that he did that was good, but because of grace that overflows from God. And indeed, if you were read, to read from Second Chronicles, uh, about chapter um, uh, twenty something to the end of Second Chronicles, you would just see one king after another, and there's not much evidence of grace. But God is still at work, still at work, and so His overflowing grace. And we're seeing here that. In this genealogy, there are some men who were rich and powerful, uh, and there were many who were poor and nobodies. Um, there's people that we know very little about at all. But here's the point. All of them were equalized by grace. They were equalized uh, by grace. Um, and so that those who were rich were brought down and those who were lowly were exalted because the rich and the powerful were brought to see it's not in ourselves it is in Christ that we are saved the Christ who will come and those who had no hope in themselves and whose lives were in the gutter they were lifted up by the Announcement of grace, the grace of God in the Christ who would come. So brethren, God's overflowing grace. It calls us, doesn't it, to begin by remembering that out of our hearts comes all manner of wickedness. Mark chapter 7 verse 21. And it is out of the heart, the abundance of the heart, that the mouth speaks, both speaking good, and also it's out of the abundance of an evil heart that people speak evil. And we're reminded that our hearts, as we read in Jeremiah, are deceitful and desperately wicked. Do I know my heart? Do you know your heart? No, we don't really know our hearts. But we pray that God will show us more and more of the wickedness in our hearts so that we will see all the more clearly and beautifully the grace of God in Christ. The grace that overflows, the grace that cancels, the grace that covers our sin. That we're no longer under condemnation. And so brethren, in the year that has ended, the year that's about to end, let's look back. Let's remember those times when uh, our lives have been particularly punctu punctuated by experiences of overflowing grace. But also let's remember that every single day our lives have been marked by grace. And as we go into another year and... Um, not knowing what it holds for us, let's hold on to that overflowing grace. There is not anything that will come into your life or my life or all of our lives for which God does not give grace. According to our, to our faith, according to his grace, be it unto us. And uh, Paul, as we uh, were reminded last week, when he was conscious of the weakness of the flesh and, and what is troubling him, the Lord said, I'm not going to take away the experience. I'm going to do better. I'm going to give you grace that will enable you to live through this experience and reveal my glory. Isn't that wonderful? That the Lord doesn't take away sometimes the things that trouble us. That would be a good thing. But an even better thing is that his glory and his grace shines from us in the midst of the thing that is so difficult in our lives. The God of overflowing grace in Christ. All our tasks, all our fears, 
all our challenges, there is grace in him for all of us. Let's notice then thirdly, we thought about God's con uh, constant faithfulness, we thought about God's overflowing grace, let's notice finally God's universal salvation. And I need to qualify that word universal uh, because it's used in a different way today. Used today, universal salvation, people say, well, every single person is going to be saved. That's not what this passage is teaching, and that's not what I'm saying. What this passage is teaching and what I'm saying is that God's salvation is for the nations. It is not just for the Jews. It's for all the nations of the earth. In that sense, it is universal. And, of course, the days in which Matthew lived and compiled his gospel, um, it was very much a day of the Jews, although things were beginning to change. Um, but here we see in this passage, Matthew deliberately records four people that he didn't need to record. Was the generation has been traced through the fathers. But there's four females in this uh, chapter. Look at verses 3 through to 6. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, look at what he says, by Tamar. Didn't need to include that. Um, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Minadab, and Minadab, the father of Nashim, and Nashim, the father of Salmon, um, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. So we discover that Rahab married within Israel. She married a man called Salmon. And again, Matthew didn't need to include Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, didn't need to include, by Ruth. And then Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And Uriah is a Hittite, not a Jew. So, what's Matthew doing? Well, he's saying to these Jewish people, the gospel in the past and salvation in the past was shown to Gentiles also, those outside of Israel. And indeed, um, their backgrounds in many cases were highly questionable. Tamar, you can read about her in Genesis 38. She's a Canaanite woman. Uh, she was married to two of the sons of Judah. And Judah, both of them died. She should have been married then to the third son. Judah wouldn't give the third son lest he would die. And so Tamar set up this scheme where she presented herself as a prostitute. And Judah was passing by. And Judah entered into a sexual relationship with her. And these two boys were born from that. Perez. In the line of the Christ. That's illustrating, isn't it, again, what we've seen already. Grace. Grace. That overflows. And so then you go to Rahab. And she was a prostitute. Uh, Joshua chapter 2. She's a woman of Jericho. She worships false gods. Like her fellow citizens. Um, she has heard about God's saving acts among the Jews. And God quickens her heart. And Rahab, boys and girls, becomes a believer. And she's the only, uh, she's the one that we know that believes in this city. And because of her faith, her household, her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters, were delivered from destruction. So here's Rahab. A Canaanite, a Jerichoite. And then you go to Ruth in verse 5. And Ruth, she's from another nation. She's from Moab. And they worship false gods also. And they are hostile to God's people. But when uh, Naomi and Elimelech and their two boys go down to Moab, um, God is over that. I believe it was a wrong decision, the light of scripture, that they made. But God was over that. Uh, Elimelech and the two boys die in uh, Moab. 
Naomi is a widow, Ruth is a widow, and Orpha, Orpha is a widow. And out of that, boys and girls, Ruth sees the faith of her mother-in-law. And again, God works to change Ruth's life and to bring her to know the God of Israel and his salvation. And here she is now. She's the great-grandmother of David, just found in the line of Jesus. And then finally, verse 6, <coughs> she's not referred to as Bathsheba. She's referred to as the wife of Uriah. John Calvin has an interesting take. I think it's Calvin has an interesting take on that. And um, he says that this woman actually, out bathing on the balcony or the housetop, what woman would do that if she wasn't saying something? She wasn't making a statement. And it's an interesting one because I've never thought about it before that Bathsheba was making a statement to David. I'm available. My husband's away. And she was putting temptation in the place, in the face of David. Now David was utterly wrong in what he did. But it's very interesting that she's described here as the wife of Uriah. Um, and so uh, the Hittite woman, and here now we see that she is in the line of David, or the line of Christ. A woman that comes into the people of God, a believer, after all the mess up of that situation. Brethren, we should be greatly encouraged at the way in which God works. He comes into our messy situations and our messy lives, and some of us have had no connection at all with the true church of Jesus Christ, and he has lifted us out of those situations. And he's brought us in to his kingdom and his grace. And he's saved us. And he's reminding us, is he not? As individuals, and he's reminding us as a congregation when he does that, that there's a people out there who are lost. People that are dying in their sin. And God has his people among the nations of the earth. And we are to be those who go out and live and witness and sow the seed of the word of God. Because God is the God in Christ of salvation, not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. Christ is, and this is the title I gave to the sermon today, the hope of of Israel and the hope of the nations. Brethren, I want us to go into the new year and to end this year 2021 by um, renewing our focus again on Christ, the hope of your life, the hope of our lives, the hope of this world that is so mixed up and so damaged and ruining itself through sin. We have the message of hope. And so let's live it ourselves and let's share it with others. Amen.